शुभ सन्ध्या गुड इवनिंग टू एवरी वन सूचर परम्परा उद्योगे विशेष उन्नमयिक आलोचना चक्र पर्व आज के मध्य उपस्थित हो विशिष्ट ऐतिहासिक अध्यापिका नारायणी गुप्त मध्य उपस्थित रही सूचर सह सभापति अध्यापिका नूपुर दासगुप्त और अध्यापिका सुचंद्र घोष आज के अनुष्ठान सभा परिचालना करबें वरिष्ठ सह सभापति अध्यापिका नूपुर दासगुप्त सकल के पक्ष विशेष पर्वगुल इतिमदे से विशेष पर्व बक्तव्य रेखे अध्यापक हरवंश मुखिया सहेब श्रद्धे अध्यापक डी एन झा दिजेंद्र नारायण झा महाशय सौरभ दुबे आज के मध्य उपस्थित होध्यापिका नारायणी गुप्त महाशय सकल के आज के अनुष्ठान स्वागत जाना मूल अनुष्ठान जावर आगे जे रखम प्रथम आर्थिक आलोचना करी कथा बोली तर जार्नि सम्पर्क तर ओभारल भावना सम्पर्क एक घर आड्डार मत मेजाज तैरी कर शुरू करफिसियल इंट्रोडिउस कर मूल अनुष्ठने जब आज के सभापतर अनुमति नहीं नकुदी अनुमति नहीं अफिसियल इंट्रोडक्शन कर पक्ष जदिव नारायणी के परिचय करान दृष्टत बला बाहुल्य तबुओनार सम्पर्क एक सामान्य परिचय कथार मध्य दिए वनर क्जे सम्पर्क एक धारणा देवार चेष्टा करब शुभ Professor Narayani Gupta has taught history at Indrapurtha College for Women and joined the Jamia Millia Islamia in 1986. Throughout her career, she has taught history and architecture. She is currently a consultant with Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage. She is a towering personality in the field of urban history. Her research has been on urban history particularly that of delhi she has authored many books to her credit she was a founder member of the Conver conservation society of delhi and has been a member of the delhi urban art commission professor narayani gupta as we said is a pioneering figure in the field of urban history in india her researches on indian cities particularly on delhi have successfully shifted the focus of urban history from the issues of urbanization to a continued process of urbanism where components of urban lives including the issues of planning civic governance urban facilities and urban culture are studied side by side professor narayani gupta has authored so many books we can see it in our ppt presentation some of her authored and edited books are important books are delhi between two empires 1803 to 1931 this is also included in the delhi omnibus delhi then and now co-authored with dilip bob and pramod kapoor A Fighting Spirit, Selected Writings of Ashoka Gupta, co-edited with Sarmishka Dutta Gupta. Urban Spaces in Modern India, which is co-edited co with Arthur Dutta. Craftsmen and Merchants, Essays in South Indian Urbanism. Kutub Minar, Head in the Clouds. Taj Mahal, co-authored with Shati Sharma. Mitoz Delhi, 1857 and Beyond. Which is co-authored with Jim Masulu, India's Colonial Encounter: Essays in Memory of Eric Stokes, co-edited with Mushirul Hasan. We welcome you, Didi, in our special talk. Thank you. Well, uh, 
गवेशक तरह खुब सहजे कि भाबा उचित विशेषकर तारा कि भाव सोर्स के देखे मन The whole point about the city is that they can only not function as a and people don't care. Don't go to jail, go to Kuntu. They are prepared to speak in different languages. So this multiculturalism that you have in town is so wonderful. I don't think I've seen it anywhere as much as in India. And over there, we need to rest there. We should be happy with that. We enjoy that. We need to nourish ourselves in urban country. Because on a given day, have to touch the double T. Our dear body is actually emotional. Now, if we are going to the hotel, you know, only when we are in the city, the city has a few periods of time. We are not sure about the rest. एवरीथिंग मूल अनुष्ठने पैंडमिक but it was such a pleasant memory and at that occasion also you had talked about uh, urban history and how uh, the future scholar research scholars you had actually advised us uh, about how uh, future research should be conducted and i remember that our, there was a huge batch of students who had attended your lecture uh, uh, the the whole auditorium was filled up and they had really gained a lot of insight from your brilliant talk we were very happy to have you with us today and i'm sure that we are going to be enriched further with your lecture uh, for this evening and i also find that uh, there is a movement away from looking at urban history from the point of view of say built heritage and the city life to uh, trying to understand civic sense and civicness and in today's world with the erosion the kind of way in which civic sense and civic uh, life in urban areas is being eroded uh, in in the whole of south asia indeed um, i mean we need to actually engage with this problem in a very very major way and i think that that actually constitutes a major component of doing urban history so i'm welcoming you didi uh, we are eager to hear you so without much more ado I think I should request you to start your lecture, please. Thank you so much. And over to Narmi. 
you know, there uh, was a lot attributed to me in that list of publications, which I take no credit for. And editing is a very cheap way of getting your name onto the cover of a book where somebody else has written. So I think my work boils down to very little. And the bit of writing which I really enjoyed was the book on the Kutub Minar, which was for children in middle school. And it was ostensibly written by them, by children. So, I mean, I'm just uh, shifting the age and say, uh, talking to older people, but my point is the same, which is that to understand the subject, get to know it yourself. Don't depend on others because the originality that you will bring to it, nobody else will be able to. I don't know whether you noticed that first poster, hmm? the first uh, slide, which was that of a poster with um, the Jama Masjid at the back and me in a corner taking up too much space. This was obviously done by Koshik or Aditya, I don't know who, but as it happened, this is a small section from one of my favorite photographs. This is a photograph from a panorama, which means a long set of photographs, which come up to nine, taken from the Minar of the Jama Masjid in February, 1858. And it is very significant. It's a very remarkable, um, thank you. It's a very remarkable photograph in the sense that I don't think the photographer thought about it at the time. The photographer is a man called Felice Beato, B-E-A-T-O. And he was one of the earliest photographers in India. And he was commissioned to go and take pictures of places affected by the mutiny. And in this panorama, which should be really enlarged enormously and studied because it's an absolute primary document in urban history. You see Delhi before the demolitions. By the demolitions, I mean that after the mutiny, the British destroyed a large part of the <coughs> city, which was between the Jama Masjid and the Lal Kila. And perhaps the most beautiful thing they destroyed was another masjid, not very far from the Jama Masjid, called the Akbarabadi Masjid. And we only knew that this had been done. But when we looked at Beato's panorama, we saw it. We saw the Akbarabadi Masjid, and therefore there it was, you know, saying, I was here once. Much later, after I had seen in this photograph, uh, when they were excavating for the metro, they found the uh, foundations of the masjid. And we had hoped that this could be made into a park and sort of teach them modern archaeology and so on. But like most things in towns, this got all muddied with politics. So nothing ever happened, which was very sad. But here is a photograph, therefore, which is a document of a time which is gone. And if you were to use other things to corroborate it by, for instance, the letters of Ghalib, who wrote uh, in 1858 and described all the havoc that was happening with the <coughs> uh, photogra other photographs of the time and with Sayyid Ahmad Khan's book on the remains of the uh, old structures of Delhi called Asaru Saradid, which has recently been translated, and with a very detailed map that was done in 1853 for Thomas Metcalf. If you and there was also a census by the British in 1847. This is a wealth of information of all kinds. And if you slowly put section by section together, you can rebuild the pre-mutiny city. Now, this is one example. There are, and must be, have to be many more. There are some exquisite maps, I'll particularly refer to one in the Pondicherry archives, 
um, which were hand painted with all the buildings indicated in them. Again, you can read a lot into them and work a lot out of them. But in the 1960s and 70s, which is when uh, my generation was doing research, archival maps were kept as a state secret. There was an excellent index, ironically, but we were not allowed to copy the maps. Sometimes we were not even allowed to look at them. Our, uh, Richard Fillimore had written a monumental work on the historical records of the Survey of India in 1945-58. Suddenly, it was banned in all libraries, the copies taken out, and nobody was allowed to read them. The Indian government even prohibited Indians from purchasing satellite maps um, of India in the USA. This was very mysterious to me. This was in the 70s. Today, in fact, about two weeks ago, my son-in-law just told me there was a welcome exception to this gender in, in a welcome exception to the spirit of the times. Maps have been released from captivity and are freely available. This and the improvements in our archival collection will make sorry, uh, urban history. Uh, less fatiguing, a rewarding field of research. It has long been in the coming. The missing, biggest missing factor in the writing and teaching of Indian history is the city. Cities and towns appear in our history books only in the context of royal capitals, battles, or treaty negotiation. Thaneshwar, Panipat, and that lovely place which I used to roll on my tongue, Surji Arjan Gaon, not to talk of Stalingrad or Aix-en-Chapelle. These are not studied for themselves. We have no idea what they look like. This is because our anxiety is to write national history, to describe the wood, not the trees. As a result, there is a disconnect between our cities and history and those that we live in. We are frequently reminded that an increasing percentage of the Indian population is moving to towns. So isn't it important to devote intelligent attention to the present and the future of towns as places of habitation? And who is better equipped to discuss the future than historians? The city, civic, civil, Civilization, these words have their own histories. They imply that cities were the places, the loci, where culture was transacted and transmitted because of conducive factors, orderly government, refined manners, power dressed in the mantle of ceremonial. The very skyline had an uplifting quality and elements of lifestyle in the city became models for others to copy. There was manifest pride in introducing yourself as the inhabitant or citizen of a city, suffixing its name to yours, Delhi, Lucknowi. Um, there was, uh, in the course of last year, we lost a number of people, and one of them was Sadia Delhi, whose family all carried that uh, as their surname, uh, who was a writer about Delhi. What a contrast to today, when most inhabitants of Delhi introduce themselves and belong to the states they come from, Kannadiga, Malayali, Uriya. But I always think there's hope. In the last 20 years, younger people are identifying themselves as Diliwalas, and its very own language, Urdu, is growing in popularity. Living in a city means being a citizen which implies freedom of choice, of places to call home, of jobs, of friends, of recreation. The city dweller can shape his own identity, create his own circle, plan his day. He's not limited by kinship or language ties or by age or occupation. Though it is easy to see oneself as a cog in a machine, there is a rather tantalizing quality of unpredictability, of opportunity in the very condition of living in the city. And as one's sense of identity gets shaped, a sense of belonging 
develops often a matter of pride in the city which has chosen you or which you have chosen but while a growing city is about the sedimentation of communities the opposite is also true the hidden persuaders the name for the advertisers urge individuals to be concerned only with themselves something which has been aggravated the last year by the pandemic towns can generate isolation the loneliness while being part of the crowd which gets aggravated again with increasing distance between home and work workplace and as we discovered now with the absence of a workplace a marker of this this is just a kind of uh, reflection i'm not sure if i'm justified in it a marker of this is the growing obsession with comfort foods which soothes us in the way companionship and camaraderie do or in the case of bengalis the way poetry and music do this can be read as an urgent need for all towns to have shared public spaces public spaces which are for everyone neither home nor workplace but sites of culture camaraderie or recreation we'll get back to this later missing historical geographies the absence of cities in our history history books is a corollary of the main missing element which is geography look back on the history we were taught in school the accounts of kingdoms and empires were seldom mapped onto natural features modern national boundaries are seen as something you have to know those of states also but these do not always coincide with physically distinct regions or the course of rivers the raichur doab sub saharan africa trans oxiana the different ways of referring to different areas but and a complete mismatch between political boundaries and uh, natural the vagueness of our geography puts history on a different plane from today's geography where our country has been frozen into modern states delineated and delineated i'm sorry in 1956 solely on the basis of language above all it prevents us questioning why towns are located where they are why they have been so enduring just think of the age of most of the town Uh, it seems that we have lost the connection uh, with Narayani, uh, Professor Narayani Gupta. So uh, we are trying to get back uh, to her. Uh, so please excuse us for uh, for uh, us for a few moments. We are trying our best to get our connection back. Uh, are we doing it koshik can we call up uh, naranidhi i think koshik is calling him i uh, calling her yeah okay okay let's wait for a few moments see let's yeah. see what so this is the problem with our uh, the connectivity with 
you know hold hey, it. there has been awful connectivity in here also yeah. yeah i think all around there's a problem yes it so happens but but for us in Shu at Shuchi, I think this is the first time that uh, the problem is happening. I mean, I, we didn't have this kind of a break in the connections previously. So maybe today is something, there is some problem. No, now the, no, now we're all right. She's back. <laughs> I think okay. I'm back. Thank you. Thank you. We were just eagerly waiting for you to come back. And then, Technology and I don't go together. <laughs> yes. Just a minute. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm so sorry, but. Uh, yeah. Um, I'll resume where I left off, which was that I said that since uh, we have this unmatching history and geography, it prevents us questioning why towns get located where they are and why they've been so enduring. Somebody should work on the patterns of urbanization. I was just thinking in the small states which have been carved out of large ones, Uttarakhand, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Telangana, and for a moment, think about their names. They're all pre-modern names. These are the Khands of old, like Bundel Khand and so on. So these were kind of descriptions of regions, and uh, it made sense to have them as separate units. Cities have grown from small towns or villages or been formally established um, by rulers or merchant guilds. They have developed around temples or shrines. Industrial complexes have expanded into towns. Royal towns like Shah Janabad or Murshidabad usually continued to have relevance because the site was carefully chosen or because an urban elite continued to provide patronage and orderly uh, administration. There's a recent category of top-down towns, the ceremonial ones which were <clears throat> built after independence, Chandigarh, Gandhinagar, and the stop go Amaravati now. They were towns which were established for their congenial location of a recreation, hill stations, the Srinagar of the Mughals, Shimla, Mahabaleshwar, and others of the British and independent Indian governments. Brahmadeyas and Madhade Marsh settlements enjoyed patronage from zamindars and commercial groups. Madurai, Ajmer Sharif, Puttuparthi. They were towns dominated by mercantile groups, Karaikudi, Ahmedabad, Kolkata. Though in many cases, of course, um, you have uh, commercial um, merchant communities like the Parsis, the Khatris, the Marwadis, Armenians, and Chetiars, who are content to occupy sections of other large administrative towns. In fact, this whole notion of how the Marwadis lived in Calcutta, how they then developed Shekhavati with uh, and um, studied it with beautiful painted uh, Havelis with the wealth that they had amassed here. It's an amazing story. Industrial cities, the prototype being England's Bourneville, were Jamshedpur, Nangal, Bhilai, and others. Dedicated towns, cantonments, railway towns, British creations. Why I have gone into all this is to show you that um, even if there are settlements in certain places earlier, the way we see them now is uh, based on much more recent history. When they become cantonments or they <clears throat> become industrial towns and or how places like weavers towns start by being villages and small and then they, uh, as the industry grows and flourishes, they become larger and uh, achieve the <clears throat> townhood as it were. The other thing that is missing 
is the sense of the civic. Services, civic centers, civic spaces, civic art. Does the word civic figure in our history books? I am not sure. It's made plural and then becomes a subject in school curricula. Units one and five of NCRT class seven. And then it vanishes. Its content is largely about national administration, again, not about living in cities. But if you think of the children, their experience is that of daily life in the city, battling with all its little problems or enjoying its excitements. It is not about standing for election or becoming a state governor for which they know all the procedural details. You could have them as election officers anytime. Patrick Geddes, who introduced civics as a subject in Bombay University in the 1920s, had visualized something quite different. Civics, he said, was rooted in the city. I am um, referring you to a short essay by him, Civics as Apl Applied Sociology. I'm sending this to Koshik along with my paper. This was read by Patrick Geddes at the Sociological Society meeting in the in LSE, London School of Economics and Political Science, as it was then, um, University of London, 1904, that is 120 years ago. He argued for a process of understanding the city. First, make a geographical survey of the region, because the city is rooted in the region. Then a more detailed one of the city itself, followed by historical survey, and then by a civic one. That this dovetailing of geography and history with the local has not caught on in India is because of the same obsession with national institutions. And because of it, perhaps the bonds between cities and city dwellers is not deep or strong. Just to touch on two major points of difference between historic West European and Indian towns. Most of our language in urban studies is drawn from Europe and England. Um, but some of the philosophy behind it gets lost. One is that living in a town made a European a free man. The medieval term freeman meant somebody who was not the property of a feudal lord and enjoyed privileges such as the right to earn money and to own land. Town dwellers were protected by the charter of their town or city and were free, hence the term freedom of the city. This doesn't happen now, but when I was younger, whenever a visiting dignitary came, they were usually ceremoniously given the freedom of the city of Delhi. Thought it rather a charming kind of ceremony. Don't uh, have it anymore. From the Middle Ages, this freedom was the right to trade, enabling members of a guild to carry out their trade or craft in the square mile, which was the city center on which I shall be uh, coming back to, to which I shall be coming back later. Studies of medieval merchant guilds in South India also suggest that they had a special place in towns and is certainly is indicated by their patronage of local places of worship. It would be worthwhile examining the privileges of living in towns and the duties expected of its inhabitants. I wouldn't like to use the word citizen, but uh, the people who lived there in earlier times and in different places in India. Secondly, there was a higher level of freedom. The autonomy of a city, as written down in his charter, which made the city a third partner in a system where the monarch and the church were the other two. I remember reading about the English Civil War in British history, where the city of London blocked entry to King Charles and his royalists, to the city taking a stand against the king. And if you think of Lord's Mayor or Lord Mayors uh, and their outfit, their apparel, short of wearing a crown, it looks grandly royal, signifies his importance. A Kotwal in an Indian town is also a powerful man, 
but uh, essentially in terms of policing the town. Civic is used for services, civic services. Citizens of a country have privileges, rights, duties. Citizens in the sense of city dwellers, which is a different uh, level altogether, have an unwritten constitution to enjoy civic services and contribute towards us by paying taxes. How clearly does the average town dweller, all of us, know what he has a right to expect from the local government? How much of the local budget is public knowledge? Is it becoming more and more remote or is it becoming more transparent? Security is priority in the city, medieval or modern. The notion of sanctuary and uh, the Indian term, andarune fasil, that is you're inside the walls, that is inside the walls, you are safe. Physical barriers, defined boundaries, rules of entry and exit, a dedicated uh, police force, adequate lining, lighting, and now, of course, the <laughs> very popular and extending CCTV. It's becoming increasingly anonymous, but yet tends to be an invasion of privacy. This has been worked on considerably, so I won't dwell on it. With growing numbers of town dwellers, this was inevitable, with rapid movement of vehicles. There are a number of research studies and recent episodes of violence, clashes between groups. But if you go to an earlier period, you won't be, as far as I know, be able to recover the immediacy of the descriptions you have of Paris at many flashpoints between 1789 and 94, in 1830, 1848, 1871. In India from the 19th century, there are detailed reports of clashes, especially during elections, religious processions, political rallies, but numbers in India are not really a measure of uh, civic participation or of uh, civic responsibility, the crowds tend to be random, a knee-jerk reaction to some political speech or act. So this is another problem with issues in urban history. How seriously do you take episodes like this? The long story of health care and educational initiatives has not been written. The theses of 19th and 20th century uh, institutions are accounts of proclaimed policy because the policy used to be set down in great detail in our archives more than of those who benefited from both these from education and from health schemes Britain and British India it's interesting launched on the establishment of viable municipalities and uh, control of uh, health um, I mean, um, attending to health and setting up schools, not uh, really about the same time. But from the 1880s, they started diverging. British towns were spending generously on water, sewerage, lighting, health, with government and private funds. Within years of the Delhi municipality being appointed in 1863, they admitted that the expenditure on education and health was in single digit percent where more than 50% of the revenue income went on the police. Not surprisingly, there was a, also a class difference in India between what was spent in areas where the British lived and the Indian towns. That was not all. It was a difference in priority, which has continued till today. Maybe it is not so obvious in Calcutta, but in Delhi, certainly, um, the police have a list of what they call VIP roads, for instance. Maybe you also do. <laughs> and then there are areas like the um, Chanakipuri um, area where the diplomatic um, houses are, the, their embassies, and the senior officers' homes and so on. So there is definitely a gradation 
much more attention paid to municipal functions um, as you go down the income level. Individual citizens in the 19th century contributed not to invisible infrastructure, but they were happy to contribute to visible elements like fountains, statuary, or public buildings. And they were quite happy to have their contribution acknowledged with the marble plug, which the British were very uh, punctilious about doing. For the rest, the word government appended to any educational institution or hospital or bus service could be sure to guarantee poor quality and sloppy maintenance. Just contrast this with the eulogies that you have for towns in pre-modern India. Should we treat these, that are the older accounts, as a geographies? Or do we see them as people talking about actual experience? So we have to work out the language, what made people write the way they did, why they got so much delight from describing towns, the trees along the roadside, the flowers. I mean, there were such detailed descriptions of these that it sounds as though living in a town was a source of great happiness. Civic centers. The towns that came into prominence in the European Middle Ages were characterized by some of the ceremonial of the ancient Romans, reborn as the square mile to which I referred earlier. In the 19th century, these became even more distinctive as city centers, where trade and business were transacted, where townspeople could feel they were a community, but also knew that at some level they were divided by class. There were official monuments there, which attracted admiration. Streets and spaces, which everyone could work on, walk on, sorry. But sometimes they could also separate people. So let us identify, just for the sake of comparison, visual features of pre-modern Indian towns. The procession way leading to temples or palace complexes or forts. The route around temples for the annual Rath Yatra, like in Puri and Madurai, for instance, and many other towns. Street bazaars, which was a peculiarly Indian feature. One thing I, that always puzzled me is why when we have so many things that resemble towns in the Middle East, like the word Mohalla, why didn't we have the souk, S-O-U-K, the shopping um, kind of spiral that you had in Middle Eastern towns? It was done in a circle with the most um, expensive shops, the jewelry shops, right in the center, protected by the others outside. Our shops, uh, shopping uh, areas, until they were all sort of uh, <laughs> thrown aside by the coming of the malls, uh, these were tended to be street bazaars along the street and little lanes leading off from them. Shahjanabad is an urban area. Shahjanabad is what came to be called Old Delhi when we were young. Now it's called just Delhi and is the um, other earlier capital um, until it was replaced by New Delhi. Shah Janabad is an urban area which encloses the Royal Fort Palace and the Royal Mosque. The mosque is still in use. The palace is a tourist attraction. Mughal public institutions and gardens were built by donations from individuals, many of them aristocratic women who gave money for setting up madrasas or sarais or gardens. And it's remarkable the number of gardens that are named after women or the donors. Recently, there has been a steady output of research on land acquisition and demarcation in the past 150 years but we know very little about earlier periods. But I think that if we dig hard enough, we might find it and in the literal and metaphorical sense. Much more modern archaeology can be done and links with natural features can be identified. 
many Mughal gardens have been have come to light because of people following their instinct or the lay of the land. You can also um, go in the wrong direction. There are some fanciful notions that the city planned by Shah Jahan was bow shaped and was in accordance with the Vastu Shastras. But actually, Shah Jahan did not shape the city. He was interested in the fort. It was a very grand fort built north of that of Firuz Toglak, which had lost its sheen in the two and a half centuries between the Tughlaqs and the coming of the Mughals. The new settlement, Shah Janabad, overlapped with that of Firuz Shah and extended to a cluster of land grants in which each beneficiary created small versions of the Royal Haveli. This has been well analyzed by Stephen Blake in his book on uh, the city. Um, the gullies which evoked so much affection and nostalgia among poets were actually not planned or made as gullies. They were paths that cur curved around these havelis and mohallas again were clusters of family or ethnic groups who built inward looking houses with a single entrance gate which made for security. So the city worked out very instinctively its own resources for security and for easy maneuverability. There is a gradation in the size width of the streets, which is also extremely well um, easy to read and makes a lot of sense. For a long time, it was believed, for uh, this is another misconception, that in Mughal cities, senior nobles had houses near the royal fort and the poorest were on the fringes. But this was not true. Plots were given to men of consequence and their havelis were miniature palace households with their dependents living around them. Those who lived in the fringes of the settled area did so for access to extramural markets or to water for their crafts. Sometimes old, older villages were enclosed into the surroundings of the port and their morphology mapped onto the later cities. What the English described as suburbs, that is transferring an English word for the Indian situation, were actually settlements which for convenience were outside the tax barriers. The subcutaneous, that is under the skin, the subcutaneous historical landscapes are very different. British and European cities are expansions from historic cores. Look at Paris. It is um, concentric circles. If you look at the building of the barriers, there's the, uh, the barriers of Fra Paris. Then there is the outlying barrier. So it kept expanding uh, like a set of circles, getting wider and wider. American towns or townships which started to be built about 300 years ago, were pasted like transfers onto the land, six miles square, all uh, planned in the grid, growing outward again on the grid and uh, named, oddly enough, one, two, three, four. There wasn't much imagination going into this. It was more practical. In its three and a half centuries, Shah Janabad has retained its two broad bazaar streets. They're still very busy, which accounted for it being labeled in 1962 when the master plan was being discussed as the CBD. I'm sure you've come across this as Central Business District. Apart from this, shops, crafts, uh, centers, and homes are intertwined. And the daytime population density in Shah Janabad nowadays is very high leading it to be labeled a slum. But if you were to do a night survey, you'd find the numbers much less because many of the residents have moved out. From the 1880s, the sense of the city as a generator of civilization kept increasing. Town improvements in Britain and India and in the USA, the building of uh, the improvements to the cities which were becoming extremely crowded and uh, polluted by factories. The building of capital cities in the British Empire. Then in India from 1950, the capitals for the new states. Till we come to today where there is a hallucination of a new India. 
way. It's too early to see where that is going. Western Chandni Chowk, like Dalhousie Square in Calcutta and Flora Fountain in Mumbai, was developed as civic centers on the British model. The town hall, clock tower, that kind of thing, that were the uh, kind of uh, signifiers of modernism. British India followed the practice of having town halls, libraries, museums, hospitals, and gardens. That is, they followed the practice of the Mughals, funded by the charity of wealthy individuals. Um, even as late as New Delhi's building, there is a lot of institutions which were funded um, by uh, private individuals rather than by the government. Today, there is great pressure for intensified use of Chandni Chowk at the same time as the inhabitants are moving out. There have been repeated attempts to improve it through the 20th century by banning polluting trades, which is the last refuge of the poor. But what has just been completed is a very courageous pedestrianization on the lines of a successful precedent in a busy street in West Delhi, Ajmal Khan Road, and as following the master plan, which has changed its label uh, for Shah Janabad from slum to heritage area. Whether this will bring back the lost poets and the storytellers, we have yet to see. What has happened was that there was a little fracas yes, uh, last week over a small Hanuman Mandir, which came up overnight and was demolished promptly by the municipality. And a new one, which was made uh, with uh, made much uh, more cleverly um, with prefabricated material, has come in its place. So the tradition of blocking roads with uh, small shrines is something that will, doesn't seem to be going at all, and it will probably um, create more troubles there later. We've yet to see. I wonder whether for a settlement to run smoothly, there should be an optimal size. It was the small princely states of India that repeatedly were praised uh, for their towns, beautiful, well-governed. And Indore, if you remember, notice, still gets the prize for the cleanest town in India. The Hyderabad of the Asif Jars, set up as a rival to the Mughals Delhi, was the first to adopt town planning in 1908. Saurashtra, Kerala, the towns of the Northeast were peaceful, clean, viable towns. In the presidency towns, Madras, Calcutta, and Bombay, um, the urban sprawl promoted them to cities, but diluted the effectiveness of the civic services. Like towns in the West, the areas of our cities are expanding. One cannot take any landscape for granted. We cannot tell time to stand still. Kolkata, which I first saw in 1966, in the twilight, was a city out of Grimm's fairy tales to my dazed mind. Blocks of solid but unquestionably old red brick buildings leaning into the road, made dramatic by streamers of lalpad shadis fluttering down. I half expected to see an amiable witch in a pointed hat leaning over a tiny balcony. A generation later, um, I saw the small changes on the route from the airport. The aesthetic interventions along the highway verges, the um, greenery, the uh, hedges, to give international travelers an illusion of a space of transition with first world civic beauty before they plunged into urban chaos. New flats were rising along the bypass and what I love about them is that they are painted in pastel colors, which is the hallmark of Calcutta. So the rolling fields are going and the vertical structures are here to stay. But it's not a case of change only in one direction. For every change brought about by those in power or those without power, that is the so-called encroachments, there's usually a counter current sometimes visible, sometimes subterranean. Planned areas are constantly countered by unauthorized neighborhoods. Dreary, crumbling stained walls are countered by arresting examples of street art 
that appear overnight. Roundabouts, glorious with imaginatively designed flower beds, are a contrast to dull, parched open spaces. The main difference between pre-colonial and later towns has been the creation of private property. At one level, a city is all about space and its allocation. And <clears throat> a term that came into use uh, halfway through my life was the term real estate. Uh, we are getting the implications of it now. So um, I'm cutting this a little. Um, so the Civic Center has been uh, replaced by the CBD, uh, not by the term inner city. And whether this is bringing back the sense of the oldest tower cities with a pride in the ceremonial and the formal and the public. And at the same time being content with one's much smaller little territory of one's own, I'm not sure. What I think we need to focus on a great deal is civic spirit, concern for the old, for children, for the disabled, because these be, uh, categories are affected by bad uh, civic management, by thoughtlessness in design, by taking over of pavements and so on. The greed of a few can ruin our cities. The sense of the public should be understood as shared, not as vacant spaces which can be appropriated. This moral code or lack of one, unfortunately, unites many Indians across classes, from 30 storied homes to thatch and clubboard shacks. And on the street, as in the padas, the rich and the large cars ride roughshod over the smaller man. The spectacular failure of the bus rapid transport street in Delhi, the BRT, today many people wouldn't even remember what it stood for, is a case in point. It has been dismantled because the cars refused to have a street where the buses had uh, priority over them. These issues also figure in Chik Bai Chow loving, uh, living sorry, in uh, Padas, but also much else. And it's worth combing through old texts, even things like the Arthashastra and literary descriptions to see how these were resolved. One new feature is from the 19th century, which we seem to be very happy to live with, is from the British uh, colonial sense of the planning principle implies that the size of one's dwelling depends on one's um, seniority. And this is slightly short-lived the joy of this uh, enjoying a big house because these are official quarters and at some stage everybody will retire. But by creating these distinctions, there is a peculiar uh, injustice in distributing urban space, which I think should be looked at. This happens in private homes too, when you talk of HIG and MIG housing high income group and middle income group, which also is rather distasteful. This could be done better. Planners hide behind rules and figures, and they often forget the terrible long-term effects of creating homes for the poor, where there is lack of sunshine, where you live at a great height, and you don't have any area to plant trees. I will end with uh, the issue of civic art. I like to recall the story of the professor who lived with his wife in a tiny apartment in the center of Paris on the fifth floor. If he was quite unfazed because he said when he came out of the flat, he had this whole glorious city to enjoy. What more could one want? This should be our attitude, that our shared spaces should be beautiful, compassionate, and lively.
there are areas that possess such a magic. You can identify them yourself, uh, like the Alagoda precinct of Bombay and uh, the India Gate lawns in Delhi at the moment. But um, these have to be preserved, maintained, and not um, taken for granted. The City as Art was the title of a book about London by a scholar called Donald Olson. Our cities should be works of art. Think textiles, architecture, garden, waterways, the beauty of India and Indian traditions. There was hope and anticipation when the Delhi Urban Art Commission was set up in 1974. Unfortunately, it has become like any other government department and not concentrating on its prime function, which is urban art with a singular, the art is singular, A-R-T, not arts. And urban art meant the art of building a beautiful city. So to end, if I'm addressing people in Calcutta, I would suggest you work for a second Bengal Renaissance make the rich intellectual and artistic capital of the city express itself visibly and in textures. Read all you can, not only of government documents, but of our poets and storytellers who loved our cities. Read the city itself, walk slowly, stop to look around and discover the historic city in the modern. Identify elements which made Calcutta deserve not the epithet city of dreadful night but city of joy thank you thank you narayani that was an extremely invigorating lecture and it was really really uh, very, very 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 pleasurable to hear you not only that uh, it's really exhilar exhilarating uh, we are really looking forward to research scholars taking up your guidance, your advice that you uh, pronounced in this lecture and really show us the day. We are senior people and really we are looking forward to the younger generation of scholars to take your advice and go further and really make uh, urban history studies uh, a fantastic uh, venue for scholars to come and uh, work together. Uh, and now actually uh, opening discussions on the paper, on the, on the presentation. And I invite uh, the scholars here present. Uh, we have, I think, with us Shekhar Bhumik, uh, our very, uh, a, a very close member of this organization. And uh, Shekhar, would you like to comment certain things or would you like to discuss uh, Naomi this? Uh, Shekhar, please, uh, um, please on your mic and on camera. Mic off, Kurla. Mashallah, Mata. Shekhar, please, 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 Diri is a constant source of inspiration for me. Absolutely. And since Didi, Adili is, Didi, the Nayani Madam is well versed in Bengali, I think. So, Amar Monehan, I think, Amar Bangla, 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 It will not be an impediment for her. <laughs> Didi, so, Amar Bangla, Shabi, Porin, Didi. Now, uh, Amar, Akhtai, Didi, Kase, Jita, Barbar, Didi, Shang, Dakamolo, me body, just small town, Gulor future, key hobby, small town history, Gulor future, Jeta, Didi, Bar, Didi, Adam, Primodern, Teke, Mane, Mughal, Town, Teke, Adam, Akonka, Elaiji, Miji, Ebong, Jeta, only last year, Mita Deka, edited Boite, Didi, conclude Korech and last, lastly, Shekhano to Didi, Ekotaguli, Bulletin. That is, uh, if my memory doesn't beat the Didi, Abdi Mita Dekar last year Boychate Apinje conclude Korechen. Okanatapi Etai Bolechen, Ekatagulu Bolechen, J. J. Amar Mone, small town Gulor Ketre Manikirokum Eglutu Kaj Hochena Didi, Mane small town history. Jita Mode Oi Ponkoj Misro, Oi Butter Chicken in Ludiana, Jerokum, the Chodjur town Gulor Korlen. 
সেগুলোর নিয়ে কি মনে হয় আপনার মানে ক্যালকাতা দিল্লি বম্বে ম্যাড্রাস তো আমরা অনেকগুলো কাজ পেলাম ইভেন কটক বা আরো যেগুলো ছিল ভুবনেশ্বর এগুলো নিয়েও তো কিছু কিছু কাজ হয়েছে কিন্তু স্মল টাউনগুলো নিয়ে দিদি কি রকম আপনার কি রকম মানে প্রসপেক্ট কেমন এবং তার এখন প্রেজেন্ট স্টেট অফ রিসার্চ কি রকম প্রোগ্রেস আপনি তো অল ইন্ডিয়া প্যারামিটার জানেন অল ইন্ডিয়া খবরও আপনার কাছে আপনি অনেক বেশি ওয়াকিবহল মানে রবি কালিয়া অনেকগুলো রবি কালিয়া অনেকগুলো টাউন ধরেছিল তো কিন্তু এখন দিদি কি সিচুয়েশন মানে এটা আপনি তো অনেকটা ডিটেল বললেন একদম একটা পুরো এভলিউশন অফ আরবান স্টাডিজ এরকম করে ইন্ডিয়াতে এভলিউশন অফ আরবান হিস্ট্রি talking to people who are not the ones. But there are some basic period of study happen, eh? but there are two things I want to emphasize. I think it's a uh, location that with, with these towns that have grown out of villages or they've been established there, who put a kind of camel here, who can actually advantage out there. Is it something that has survived from an older town? Or is it something that has grown up first? Exactly. Right, a mushkil house. And the physical features, what uh, I was doing, the uh, physical study, the 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 physical study, why it is taking the street of the house. Because mm-hmm. all of the natural towns that have grown organically, naturally, they go low right now, go on the big group, justification hotel for the location and that is something mm-hmm. that we have to look for we won't find that in it but talk to the people and see so the okay what is it that is important for them in the city let them talk you know i think our problem is several questionnaires may die and expect them to answer they might want to do something else Exactly. I just about the idea when there's a story of this girl who used to go to Dalhousie year after year. And the people would say, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. Didi, how do you think about this? I mean, I'm in the Prachin Bharat, I mean, I'm in the middle of the Bharat, I'm in the middle of the Bharat, I'm in the middle of the Sabrigenal Township, তার কিন্তু এভিডেন্স আমরা কোনো কোনো জায়গায় মানে ইনস্ক্রিপশনস থেকে পাই আর মনুমেন্টস থেকে পাই তো এই যে একটা বিল্ড হেরিটেজের যে ব্যাপারটা রয়েছে সেটা কিন্তু এক্সটেন্ড মানে সেটা কিন্তু মধ্যযুগেও আমরা পাচ্ছি এমনকি কলোনিয়াল পিরিয়ডেও পাচ্ছি উপনিবেশিক যুগেও পাচ্ছি যেমন আমি আরেকটা এক্সাম্পল দিতে পারি আমাদের বাংলার ক্ষেত্রে মুর্শিদাবাদ সহ মুর্শিদাবাদ বা বহরমপুর এখানে কিন্তু এই যে বাড়িগুলো যেগুলো ভেঙে ফেলা হচ্ছে মানে মাঝখানে মুর্শিদাবাদ সংবাদ বলে একটি ছোট্ট পত্রিকা বেরোতো এবং সেখানে এরা যারা পত্রিকাটা চালাতেন তারা কিন্তু এগুলো তুলে ধরে দিয়েছিলেন যে কিভাবে ওখানে প্রমোটিং চলছে এবং তার ফলে যে পুরনো বাড়ি সুন্দর সে সমস্ত মানে যে আর্কিটেকচার সেগুলো সমস্ত নষ্ট হচ্ছে তো তার ডকুমেন্টেশন মানে এগুলোকে তো আমরা রুখতে পারবো না কারণ এগুলো প্রাইভেট হাউসেস সেগুলো তাদের মালিকরা যদি হস্ত হস্তান্তর করে দিয়ে থাকেন লিগালি আমরা লুক রুখতে পারা যায় না কিন্তু ডকুমেন্টেশনটা করাটা অত্যন্ত প্রয়োজনীয় ফলে আমার মনে হয় ইতিহাসের তো নানা ধরন আছে মানে আমরা একটা তো মেমোরির দিকে যাব মেমোরিটাকে আমরা স্টোর বিভিন্ন ভাবে করতে পারি কি না আমি সেটাই ভাবছিলাম যে আমরা প্রাচীন প্রাচীন ক্ষেত্রে বা আদি মধ্য যুগ থেকে কিন্তু নানা ধরনের এভিডেন্স আছে যেগুলো ইট কাঠ পাথরে আছে সেগুলোকে নেওয়া মানে পুরনো যদি আমরা লং টার্ম লং জিউরি হিস্ট্রি করতে চাই আর এছাড়া যেটা রয়েছে সেটা হচ্ছে যে একটু যারা যারা প্রবীণ রয়েছেন আমাদের মধ্যে তাদের গিয়ে জিজ্ঞাসা করা ইন্টারভিউ নেওয়া যেটা আর যেটা আপনি বললেন যে 
दिल्ली बेंगल कंक्लूशन जमींदारेंगल पीरियड Seems of interest. So, when to say you can uh, explain that. Expand. Right. Yeah. I mean, there is a book I have read which is about one street in Paris. Is that the last one? Or Kolkata? Nee, Nishtha Pandya Shab Janen Tangapan Nairer Kajka. Ha. Tangapan Nairer. Ha. 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 This book called Streets of Calcutta. Uni prithvi badi the ke thak ko ke han kam ko sab lokhe. कलकतावर्तन हो And uh, there are so many houses which are not changing because of their price. Taka, no heritage house, but like, but heritage is for 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 their company. So, for example, I say it might just disintegrate or it might be given to the builders. It should be a constant present coming to conversation. You know, you can see what is happening in the past. That also is a part of history once more. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. So thank you. Those were very important suggestions. So Shekhar, come our question answer will check it out. Chutu Shahar, I mean, this me, this big architecture, this not me. This big, some big institution, not me. But data, ah, see, you know, this is, you know, you know, some big, you know, so many, hello, hello. कलकाल कलकत्ता 
जाबो लकडाउन समय लकडाउन समय चले चले दीदी narayan ji your voice is breaking could you could you please act to apna act to khane jodi set kora jay ha shubham shubham ache okane ek to bolo oke tale de ha mane basically onar okane problem ta hocche na na seta bujhte parchi take pictures of now it's now it's better didi now it's better दीदी एक लैपटपर का दीदी सुचंद्र दी तुम प्रश्न प्रश्न रख बंद कर डिफरेंटिएटरलैंड इम्पोर्टेंट इनसिपियंटिज्मीजम 
তো এইরকম ধরনের সমস্যা তো আমরা প্রাচীন ভারতের ক্ষেত্রে আমরা পাই তো এই যে টার্মিনোলজিক্যাল প্রবলেম যেটা এই হোম হোমল্যান্ড হিন্টারল্যান্ড এটা কি আপনাদের সময় যখন আপনারা দেখছেন মিডিভাল কিংবা মডার্ন তখনও কি এই সমস্যাগুলো টার্মিনোলজিক্যাল সমস্যাগুলো আসছে এটা একটা আমি জানতে চাইছি আর একটা প্রশ্ন হচ্ছে আপনি ইউ মেনশন মানে বলার মধ্যে অমরাবতীর কথা বলছিলেন যে হাউ সাম স্পেসেস আর কামিং আপ and we all know that amaravati is being projected as the capital of andhra uh, but this kind of selection of a very uh, which had a completely different character in the past amaravati khetre ekta important buddhist site which was pr- predominantly a buddhist site jar connectivity chilo of course to eta ki tar character ta ke mane how far um, ওদের যে প্ল্যানিং টা আছে আমি খুব ভালো জানি না মানে ইফ ইউ আর এভার অফ ইট ওই সিটির ক্যারেক্টারটা কি রাখছে ওল্ড ক্যারেক্টারটাকে রেখে তারপরে ওরা দে আর ট্রাইং টু ডু এন্ড হাউ ফর দিস ইজ অ্যাডভাইজেবল আমি জাস্ট এমনি জিজ্ঞাসা জানতে চাইছি দ্যাট আমরাবতি क्वेश्चन इज रियली इंट्रिगिंग एंड आई एम गोइंग टू आस्क यू टू टेक इट अप एंड वर्क ऑन इट बिकॉज अम ওখানে অনেক মিডলান creating a whole artificial kind of city which you can't go wrong with it has to be just so yeah and um, a model like that looks a bit frightening you know it's a bit something That's... that can be done on a very small scale but but at the moment i don't know and you've um, intrigued me now i want to go and find out and i'll try and do so but um, the character of the place it uh, um, again was amaravati today is it particularly buddhist no no, no not at all no, no. Mm. this is the history right mm, right yeah um they have chosen it because it's evocative i mean the story of amaravati right. you remember was colin huh. mckenz going there and right, finding right. it was in uh, being broken fast by local zamindar who was powdering mm. up sandstone to line mm. the road ইউরোপিয়ান european or western word okay mm-hmm. so this kind of symbolically appeasing them by saying the new name for the capital of australia you know there is so much of symbolism in urban um, iconography i mean right if yeah. you sit down you can do a whole lot in the past 10 years and see mm-hmm. what is the things that are happening starting with those little elephants of uh, uh-huh. my avatar and <laughs> right you know, absolutely yeah yeah true again it's not a question of snobbery and saying how you know something is not aesthetic and so on. you must understand where it comes from why they want that sort of thing, why they prefer that um so that is a very dicey subject i mean what you think is beautiful what you think is appropriate and so on um as to the choice of the site i'm not sure again ignorance i don't know what amaravati is like as a site for a town but mm-hmm. this uh, buddhist thing doesn't bother me very much yeah, yeah. <laughs> just a kind of gesture to the past and leaving it in that you know um, yeah what would the alternative be i wonder which place to be and i think they're now saying we will have three capitals you know yeah. it is in south africa the legislative is in one town the uh now the president mm-hmm. is so that's not right. a bad idea mm-hmm. that's the good idea thought of for india in 1957 uh, 1947 
they had something like that, you know, having more than one capital. The cultural capital, the political capital, and you have. Exactly. Yeah. You know, just let your imagination run and think of other ways of doing it. As to the question of hinterland, and this is the region of archaeology, you have to work out things like how much distance is a practical, or, I mean, mm -hmm. um, around Delhi there are many Sarais, and many of them have been destroyed. But even with what remains, you can make out the distance from the city, seven miles roughly, and to be able to work out where the next one might be. The Grand Trunk Road is a major, you know, I know, to see how it works. So you have to um, see what your town was doing. Was it producing something which it needed to export? Or was right. it an administrative capital? I mean, all that is to be worked out. I don't envy you. I remember taking part in a seminar where Ara Sharma was speaking, and I was going to say, we have so little material for modern India. And then he came and spoke, and after that, I became very quiet. <laughs> one bead, one necklace, one blessed bead, and one skull or something. He had this whole theory of urbanization sort of <laughs> setting up. Oh my God. <laughs> so we, are we, have, uh, we have a few uh, comments here from Urbi Mukherjee. Uh, I, I, I'm reading it out, uh, but uh, it's not coming in total. Uh, the whole comment is not uh, visible. Yeah. But uh, what she is trying to say is that uh, she says this is a this is a humbling experience listening to Professor Narani Gupta. Oh, you no, encompass such a wide such a wide variety of issues relating to city. Yeah. I would like to clarify. Then she goes on to say, I would like some clar. I think she wants some clarifications about misconceptions. She wants you to talk about the binary between civic and military in the urban context. Yes. So uh, could, you, uh, could you enlarge on that? Memoirs as a source of urban history. Yeah. Uh, very different. I am not sure what it means by civil and military. She's talking about the space occupied by the army. Or should the cantonments, which are often separate? No, I mean there's a cantonment oh. town. Or, or uh, can you can you specify? Can you specify what you mean by uh, the urban military and urban, you know, like urban urban uh, distinctions? Civic so, uh, by the by the way, there is another next query uh, where mm -hmm. she wants you to talk about how to deal with uh, urban Mem memoirs. I saw that. Urban memoirs as source of urban history. So, um, urban memoirs, I suppose it means memoirs of somebody who's lived in a town. Hmm? Uh, well, look, whether these are official documents or they are private letters or private memories, um, you have to realize that you don't just repeat what they're saying. You'll have to understand why they're saying it. I mean, this, I'm sorry, it's sounding very vague. I can't think of an example immediately. Um, but for instance, people writing about Delhi in Urdu or Hindi or Hindustani tend to get extremely nostalgic about it and will write about it in very similar kind of phrases, you know, uh, thinking of it as a city which has changed beyond, uh, you know, you can't uh, recover the old city and so on. So nostalgia depends on what age you write your memoirs. Nostalgia is a very major component and uh, you have to make allowances for that. You have to remember who they are and the very fact that they sat down to write their memoirs suggests that they are fairly comfortable in life. I mean, uh, you're not going to get, uh, generally speaking, people who have had hard lives sitting and filling their memoirs. So they definitely are a source to be used. You can't, you really have to use everything that comes in hand, uh, photographs, memoirs, conversation, and uh, with, as I said repeatedly, with an open mind. 
because they didn't understand what things matter to them then, which may not have struck you. And even their terms of phrase, the way they speak and the thing they emphasize will be something that a much younger person finds rather unusual or even amusing. So it has to be done with a lot of thought. Have you figured out the civil and military? I, I, sorry. No, not yet, Didi. Not yet. I have no doubt. I don't have the clarifications as yet from her. So, can we can we go to the next? Uh, any anyone else asking questions? Then uh, Topotiti. Topotiti is here. Uh, oh. Topotiti is remarking. She's she's commenting that it's a fascinating talk, and she truly enjoyed it. Uh, and she loves it. She loves it. She's very happy. So she okay. and, and me by the Malayalam word for the D, which is Erdi. Erdi. Yes. I told her not to trouble herself, and thank you so much for coming. It meant a lot to me. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't remember whether there was a question. I got so overwhelmed at that point. <laughs> <laughs> no, there wasn't any question from her, but there is a question from Imon Roddur. Uh, yeah. And um, she he says, uh, my question towards Narani Gupta, ma'am, urban, it's about urban archaeology. He says urban archaeology is a subdiscipline of archaeology, specializing in the material past of towns and cities where long-term human habitation has often left a rich record of the past. In modern times, when someone talks about living in a city, they are in an area with many surrounding people and buildings, generally quite large ones. In archaeological terms, cities give great information because of the infrastructure they have something. I mean, this is rather not a question exactly. I can't get the no, question. It's a reflection. It's, yeah, this is <laughs> rather. So, well, you know, there is a subject called modern archaeology, which is looking yes. at historical cities or looking at dilapidated parts of towns. I mean, that's just something that came into my head just now. The town of Glasgow in uh, Scotland, I don't know what any of you been there. If you haven't, you should go and see it. It's to me a story of hope because I saw it as a student and it was in very bad shape really was really dilapidated, the people were gloomy and they kept talking about the great days of the past. But the fact was that all the reasonably good housing had become working class housing and working class meaning a bit like the Charles of Bombay, very crowded, it was an area called the poor booze, even the words strike me as well. <laughs> G-O-R-B-L-E. <laughs> Next time I saw it, many years later, Glasgow is called the Garden City of It is so beautiful because it made an effort. I didn't know they got the funds together, but the municipality has transformed the city. And it's a goal to do anything that for that to go because the people are exactly what they used to be, which is very filthy and social. And the surroundings are very so you have to do modern archaeology to see the changes in the costumes of the town, in the physical environment. You know the word especially, especially archaeology is very, very uh, a, a, a very useful tool, especially if you do urban history, especially looking at the built environment. Yeah. So and also, you know, like looking at hydrological patterns, how you're using the waterfronts in case of areas which are near water and uh, water bodies and like this one i think there is one kind of project going on about the manhattan waterfront area or something like that i was looking at it some time back so but we do not have it much here i mean at least historians not in one person who Unfortunately, we have lost. He died at a very tragically young age. Professor Sunil Kumar of Delhi University. Um, yes. He was working on a very exciting project. I mean, he's written up some of it and he gave a lot of talks on it. 
um, on the canals in Delhi, the Delhi area, so it's a central land. I mean, each of the Delhi's had its own hinterland, but they were to get water from a great distance. And every successive set of rulers would add to the canals. And he saw that there was a whole pattern of how the rivers came down, the water came down from the hills of the ridge to the Gemini, to the slope was like that, yes. and left near Nizamuddin. And then right. the right. common, so it all made sense. And unfortunately, we've done and covered up the Nalas, or we have turned them into robes. So you don't remember what they look like, what the alignment is. Yes. So that is a very, very interesting way, I mean, to look at urban history. It's extremely important. Mm -hmm. We you have a younger know. scholar. We have an, another pro uh, question to you. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> मानसिकता so, I think he wants to know that. When the shift, 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 shift of capital. How, the, how it affected the people. How it affected the, you know, like. Uh, not physically, perhaps, but uh, notionally. Uh, you know, the people of Shahjanabad uh, weren't bothered. <laughs> they used to they used to go in summer when the buildings had gone up to Shimla. They'd go and say, let's go and look at this funny new building. So they'd come across and wander around through New Delhi and say, what's that? We want to live here. So did you mean Calcutta and Delhi? Or do you mean Old Delhi and New Delhi? No, he, he's talking about the shift of capital in colonial yeah, days from, from Kolkata, Kolkata to Delhi. Kolkata to Delhi. Oh, I'm so sorry. I think we will So that is uh, that is something. Yeah. yeah, I have read on a lot of things what they've said. The greatest um, opposition to it in Calcutta came from the chambers of commerce because yes. it's at their center, you know, and they were doing very well. And Calcutta was economically at that time in very good shape. And this town, it was beautiful. It was very well maintained. You know, it was a great. Time and simply for political reasons, the British went and shifted the capital. So that was a big blow to them. Mm -hmm. If you think about the CIT, the CIT is set up soon after the 1911, right. at the same time, Delhi, and CIT expands Calcutta to the south. And all this Bali Gandhi area and so on get developed at that time. So, you know, I mean, um, while they might have been set at the capital being taken away from them, they had a new Calcutta to look forward to, as it were. That's what I would say. <laughs> you know, which, I mean, in New Delhi, uh, you know, I don't know whether you realize this. But the city of New Delhi was delayed and delayed because of the World War, which does not seem to happen in Calcutta. So New Delhi was ready only in 1931, 20 years, which was supposed to have been done in four years. Mm. So there was this sense of waste of money, criticism of the plan. It was not a very happy project. So uh, it's not as though all the money shifted to Delhi and uh, it was doing very well and Calcutta doing badly. On the contrary, I would say that Calcutta was better off without the burden of the imperial <laughs> rule and we were able to concentrate on um, its two character, which is more of a commercial thing. It should have thought of Bombay as a rival, not New Delhi. <laughs> Yeah, because Bombay has yeah, been yeah. gone and called itself the chief city of India. I mean, they just labeled themselves that and wrote it. Mm. <laughs> it was 
prima and in the created a culture. <laughs> so, so there's a sense of civic pride there. Right. There was a I kind of, there, there was a kind of a parochial sense of loss of power maybe among the general population at least uh, the politically aware people in Calcutta possibly, but beyond that, uh, no. As I said, the commercial interests were bothered. Yeah, um, commercial interests. British. Yeah. Uh, the political. Well, you think about it. The partition has been revoked. Pradeshi movement has started and is continuing past its peak, but it's still going to continue after 1911. So the Bengal style of politics is going on. Yeah, and, that was going on. and Bengal has been united. <laughs> I mean, they gave with one hand and took away with the other. <laughs> we have to put them all together and see. And read as many letters at that time as possible. I mean, the one wonderful thing about Bengalis is that they write to me to me. <laughs> you know, uh, letters, family letters, and so on, which you can dip into. I mean, you must make a general appeal that nobody should throw away own letters. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, so nowadays there, there, there are collections going on about this epistolary collections yeah. Yeah. because many people are doing that. Uh, modern day. <laughs> there is uh, another uh, last question. I think we should, after this, this should be the last question, Koshi. Oh, this, uh, uh, this, is, this is from, uh, you see, you can see it below. Uh, if you like to respond to this. Nature. Uh, uh, we're talking about Vishwa Bharati, is it? Nature centric. He's not, really, he's not really talking on your uh, lecture subject today. I mean, like, he's well, thinking about. But if you have any opinion on this, I think somebody should mention Shantini Ketan. Why, why don't we have a history of Shantini Ketan? <laughs> no, we do have one a very small book. Oh. About Bishwarati itself, but mm. beyond that, with Bolpur and Shantiniketan, there should be an interesting juxtaposition of Bolpur and Shantiniketan. Bolpur, na, Nupurji, Bolpur er kete chitto to chitto priyo mukhabadha one work. All this is a economic perspective, but it is of immense for any uh, novice, I think, any beginner, I think. Na, ami bolchi ki bolu to je. Bolpurir je manushi kotha shanti ni kitan eter bhitore kintu ekta ekta ontorale ekta clash ache ei je kintu ekta itihash ekta kora jay majhik itihash ekta intellectual history kora dite mane khub mane to be more precisely at a culturally but quote unquote culturally inferior and culturally superior jodi mane quote unquote mane <laughs> you know, uh, Narendra, this is another very interesting element of doing urban history, especially to do with those towns, townships which grew around universities. That's so right. if you, you look at Oxford, the Oxford University area and how the residents of that area uh, do not really come in close, they have to come, come in close contact with the people residing uh, outside exactly outside the university area but you know their sentiments clash uh, culturally there is a kind of a, a a kind of a you know problems going on constantly so this this interrelations in the adjacent to university towns like bishop this might come out as a very interesting thing <laughs> it's one of the rural area <laughs> yes. yeah, well, it's like uh, Ashoka University or uh, Jindal University and so on, which are in rural areas. Uh, Shivnada, yes. you go past fields and fields, and suddenly you reach a huge campus. You know, like a fortress, like a unconnected with the outer world, uh, a little disconnected kind of. So, Koshik. I think uh, we have had enough questions. Narnidi has filled us with a lot of 
pleasurable moments and a lot of insights into urban history. We are really enriched. I'm, I'm enthralled and I'm enriched. And I, I know that everybody here, whoever was here in, with us, uh, are all very, very happy and satisfied. Uh, and we would like to have a Thanksgiving for Nara Nidhi. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, Nupurdi. Uh, just uh, act a permission here. Did he act a personal actor? Rakshi Amar Toruf take a little bit. Uh, Narani, the actor Jinish Barbar Mone Hoetse, Mania Bishishkuri Amaratske, did a Mone Pore at Silo Abner Clark, and Abner Atke Abne Bolata Shunta Shuntami, basically Amar. ক্লাসের কথা মনে পড়ছিল আমি অনিরুদ্ধ বাবুর ক্লাসে আরবানাইজেশনের ক্লাস করছি সেটা আমার আজকে মনে এসে যাচ্ছিল একদমই সেই এটা ফিলিংসটা ছিল আজকে তো সেটারই সূত্র ধরে একটা প্রশ্ন করছিলাম মাথায় এলো যে একদিকে যখন আমরা দেখছি গৌর আর পাশেই রামকেলি রামকেলি একটা small town ship niche gram village kintu not like uh, normal village she can be get the vaishnav ramkeli was a vaishnav pilgrimage site so koshi absolutely absolutely shekhar da shei khane jokhon dekha jacche je ekta mane position e chaitanno aschen chaitanno khane aschen ebong shei position e rupshanatan okhane giye tar shonge dekha korchen at that position, Rupshanathan, administrator Shane head, Hussein Sharokhane. Ebong Sheikhan theke Ramkeli je pilgrim center huye develop kora. Shetar kintu ekta onno importance. Je importance to, mane ami just oni du dhuma kotha tai bolchi je oni bolchi na oi Ramkeli pilgrim center huye othar khetre. Ei je ekta power er shonge connection royeche. J power connection ta transfer hoche ek dikhe nawab aur ek dikhe ek dum ek jan shonna shi je total bishoy ta ke religion ta ke onno bhabe dekche shei je change ta hoche e change ta er kotha matha ekhe amar ekke prashno jagche je achke jokhon amra dekchi bivinno khetre bivinno je like iskon ram krishna mission এই রকম ভাবে তারা যখন কোন একটা এরিয়াকে পুরো কভার করছে আর বড় এরিয়াকে এবং সেটাকে একটা সাবসিটির মতো করে তৈরি করছে সেখানে কোথাও বা আমি ভারত সেবাশ্রম সংঘ বলতে পারি বা অন দা अदर হ্যান্ড আরো এরকম রিলিজিয়াস জায়গাগুলো যেগুলো বাইরে রয়েছে যেখানে বিশেষ করে পিলগ্রিম সেন্টার নয় কিন্তু তৈরি হয়ে উঠছে সেখানে একটা পাওয়ার পলিটিক্স কিভাবে আরবানিটিকে নিউ New at a phase, ditch. Eta Judic to Valen, when a religious power politics, Sheta Kiva better, Arbanitic a new phase, ditch. You know, um, Romy Koslavola, the architect, that is once used the term, um, Middle Earth. There are some showers, they can have to put. Sai Baba, Sai Baba Shahorta. And poor at the urban settlement. You look at Oroville. You know, these are places which are run according to certain principles or beliefs and so on. The people who come there come because of that. Uh to give the but they find great happiness in living there. The towns are very well maintained. It is one extreme, you know, of artificial uh, cult towns that are actually established. So it's interesting because, for instance, when you talk about Ayodhya, nobody talks about the town. Absolutely. A temple, a mosque, and a something else, you know. <laughs> nobody is saying that. This Town will see Ram Rajya. We will hear that will get the glory of Ayodhya. I mean, that's yet another dimension. Mm. So, but what is like Gorakhpur? Gorakhpur mm. is a place for the, uh, the Goraknath Sadhus. Mm. 
or what's his name? That chief minister of UP. He's from the uh, Gorakhpur uh, itself. Yogi. Adityanath Yogi. Huh? He has been good work done on this <laughs> by a um, girl in, uh, who's now in Canada. Um, that would be Malavika uh, Kasturi. And hmm. uh, he has worked on the Gorak. In, in fact, her article is in the book that uh, Shekhar wrote to. Um, Collection of essays, and she shows how Okami Ura, I mean, Kapile, they have extended the area of the mud. The mud is very small, Okami is a big thing, it's controlled the whole city. So, they perform Ura, so they've controlled the escape of the Bare, Maratha Bare, either by buying land or controlling the people, by introducing institutions. All these have to be studied because this is traditional. I mean, temples did have land. If you go to Kanchipuram and you jamin to the car jamin bolo swami swami mane bhagwan. That means templar. So shabo kana gaye the kahan netaashe harvesta. So tab mande the ye ro kandi ke street. You know, so the temple is owner of land, <laughs> as controller of people, is Shabatya. And that period is wonderful. You should go back to the book, Jita Akon, uh, Burton's time, Temples in South India. Charter Sayachi by different people. You must have seen it. <clears throat> so the power of the temple. Puta Akuna Virupani Chulchi. So now they'll have other nexuses with other people, other kind of political control. And so, on. so you have to look at it. This is why I said, okay, you can just see what dominates. Don't go with a preconceived idea, but just see what is it that makes people, what is it they talk about most? Refer to me. <laughs> Very interesting. Thank you, Didi. Thank you, Didi. Thanks a lot. Uh, so, so really Michelle, uh, we have all the all the questions over. So please go to the vote of thanks, Patiti. Okay. Um, <laughs> we have really enriched with the uh, talk and the discussion. This is our honor to be with Professor Narayani Gupta, and uh, really, really, it was fascinating. So, and I would like to thank. Professor Nupur Dashgupta, Professor Shuchandra Ghosh, Professor Shekhar Bhomik, Professor Arvi Mukhopadha, and all the viewers and all the commenters and the, all the executive body members and the members of Shuchi, that is Society for Understanding Culture and History in India. I would like to thank my young team. Other than those, it was not possible to go through with these type of programs regularly. So I thank them all. And for Shokuler Journal, I'm on the feedback form to Deva Roche. So um, just fill up the today's feedback form. And our next program on 5th of March, 5th of March, for the first time, Amra Amonek Joner lecture 5th of March, Shunbo, Amonek Jon Gobishoker. Jake Kinto Amra, Shebhabe Kolkata, Kokuna Shune Utini Amadir Mode, Shubham, please post a take to share Kor, Abadito Jetako Amadir Mode, Bolbin, Dia, Doctor Boijo and Tirai, Doctor Boijo and Tirai, Namar Master Machine, Doctor Honor Durai, Shuputri, only Germany, Nazism, Report Katskurchen, continuous postdoctoral Katskurchen, Akoni Bolbin, Nazi Bad, Harut Toto of Harut, Abishai. Dr. Bojanti Rai, 5th March Bolben, Shokulke Janai, Shekhane Apnada Amade Shonge Thakben, Amade YouTube channel, Protector Lecture Upload Korahoi, Shegulu Apnada Degben, Comment Korben, Amade Shonge Thakben, Apnada Feedback and Montidi, Amade Janabin, Jar Kibabe Amra Halo, Kats Korte Paria, Apnada Shongo Shop Shomai Kamu, Shokulke Honova Jani, Atske Onustan Amyakan Amra Shesh Kurchi. Shubhodatri, good night to all of you. Thank good you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.